Welcome. You saw the title. You know exactly what this video is about. Questions and answers, AMA, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and also, by the time this video goes up, I should hopefully have hit 10,000 subscribers. Right now, I'm at 9,920. So, yeah, recording this on Sunday, August 9th, 8.55 p.m. And, um, yeah, realistically, I mean, here's the thing. I definitely did not expect to make this video, if at all, but definitely not as soon as now. I started YouTube back in November 2019, and I'll go more into the specifics when you guys have your questions that I'm going to read off here. I didn't expect to have 10,000 by now. Not going to lie. Most people, you know, most people, I don't know about most people, but me and a lot of people, when you first start, you're just like, who the hell is going to watch my videos? Like, what the hell is so special about me? Why does anybody want to watch me when there's people like Linus, MKBHD, Jace, Who Sends, Bitwit, Gamers, Nexus? You know, all these people. Um, what's so special about me that you guys want to watch? I still don't know. So if you guys want to tell me, that would be awesome. So, um, but also, thank you guys very much for the, for the 10,000. Again, didn't think I would get here. I'm not going to pretend to cry or anything like that. I'm not a very emotional kind of person. So, yeah, just thank you. I truly mean that, though. <laughs> so, um, we're going to start off with some questions. And this video is going to be quite long because... You, so, so the reason why I'm going to make this quite a lot, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, is because, or answering a lot of questions, when I watch Q&As, I get sad, not sad, but like I'm like, ugh, that's it? Like when the video is like 10 minutes long. So I don't know how long this is going to be. It might be more than 10 minutes. It might be at 10 minutes. But I'm going to ask, ask a decent amount of questions. And if you don't care, that's fine. Um, you got your thank you. If that's all you want to hear, that's totally fine. You don't have to be here for the rest. But hey, if you want to keep my watch time up, thank you. So uh, question number one, what do you do for a living? So this kind of ties into YouTube quite well because I am a product specialist. So I don't mean that as in sales, but what I mean is that I literally have to specialize in product knowledge for what I do. I work at an auto industry, in the auto industry for a dealership. So I'm trained to know how everything about all the vehicles work, all the features, all that kind of stuff. And then I train employees and customers and all that stuff. So that's what I do. So I guess that kind of helps me with YouTube because I don't know how I would be doing videos, like how I would teach you guys stuff. Like I know I would probably do it, it would probably be much more different than it is now though. What made you start your own channel? So this kind of ties into the first question. Oh, by the way, I kind of, I'm not gonna read particular comments. I kind of read all the comments and just wrote a list down because a lot were duplicates. So I didn't wanna just like, you know, read a lot of the same stuff. So yeah, but anyways, what made you start your own YouTube channel? So again, this ties into the first question for where I work. So. Being that I'm in an auto industry and I work in a, a state that's called an at-will state, meaning they can fire me literally tomorrow if they wanted to for no reason at all, and I can't do anything about it. I mean, I can get unemployment, but that's it. Um, so I need to future-proof my, my, my future. I'm not going to... I know for sure I don't want to do this for a living for, for the rest of my life. Um, but something like YouTube just sounds super awesome and fun. Like, I had a lot of people convincing me to and you know back to the first question back to not the first question but before the intro I'm like but nobody's gonna watch me there's gonna be no point but you know what it was worth a shot and I was like I'm gonna give myself five years if I don't see any progress within five years then I'm just gonna give up but I gave myself a lot of time and well I only I only needed one year to realize that something's gonna happen clearly um things can happen anything can happen in life so Maybe this doesn't take off, but I want it to. Uh, but this is what made me start my own channel. And was I confident that I was going to succeed? Which was uh, the next question. No, I wasn't actually. Because again, this market is... Not just this market, but every market in YouTube is super saturated. And it's just like... I don't know what I'm bringing to the table. Clearly I'm doing something right, but I don't know what I'm bringing to the table that makes you guys want to watch it. Like when I first started... I got all my friends to subscribe. I don't, 57 subscribers now. That's not all my friends. I do have a little bit of more than that. But I mean like all my Discord friends and people that care about tech stuff like that. Um, so I remember 57 subscribers and then slowly just kept going up and up and up and that snowball effect just eventually took off. So 
Yeah, I mean, was I confident at all? Hell no, dude, I was. I didn't think I would get 10,000 at all, let alone a year, not no, 10 months. You mentioned that you were trying to get into the esports scene for CSGO. How far did you get in how, for how long? So I played CSGO for a total of two years from 2016 to 2018. And I played a lot of, I was learning a lot for within the first year. So I was just, you know, matchmaking. I was a gold Nova two for my first rank, complete garbage. Um, but that was in 2016. So fast forward to 2017, when I started taking CSGO seriously, I'm like, oh crap, I really want to get into this and try to become a pro. So I went into ESEA instead. This is where, if, for those that don't know what ESEA is, it's like at least $7 a month. You pay, you get better servers. Um, you get to experience a different kind of level. Like, yes, there are scrubs there too, but the skill level like cap is much higher than what you can do in matchmaking, regular old matchmaking. So I was A plus in ESEA, um, which actually is my next question. What was your what was your rank in games like CSGO and Rainbow Six Siege, which I'll get to, but A plus in ESEA on my way to rank G. And I got as far as main on the ESEA leagues, tournament leagues, which is one level below MDL or Mountain Dew League. So, I mean, it was far, it was close, but it was far because if you didn't get there, you still didn't get there. So I eventually just got burnt out and I was just like, I, I can't deal with this game anymore. Cause it got to the point where I was just training constantly, um, like with maps with my team and I was just not having fun with the game. So didn't have fun, got bored of it and just literally stopped playing. I let them know though. I didn't just be like, Hey guys, I'm not showing up anymore. Like, you know, it's kind of like the two week thing at work. I, I let them know. I made sure I had to do what I needed to do with them before, uh, before the tour before the tournament season ended. And then when it ended, I just stopped playing. I just couldn't do it anymore. What is your rank in games like CSGO and Rainbow Six Siege? Uh, well, I got the CSGO one answered. Rainbow Six Siege, the highest I got was Plat 2, and I don't take CS, uh, Siege very seriously. That's a game that I like to mess around with. I always pick random, every operator I can get, just random. My favorite random, and sometimes a picker on purpose, is Clash, because you troll the hell out of people with just electro electrocuting them, and then just, you know, switching the shields, and then spin it around, and then grab the gun, and then boom. So it's just so fun trolling people with that. So in that game, it's a really trolly game and you can have a lot of fun, even in the high skill levels. Like you can really have a lot of fun trolling some high level players to like, oh, I'm gonna get you because you're being an idiot doing stupid stuff. I'm like, well, you underestimate my stupidity. You won't be able to predict me. Next question, how can your fans help you get, by the way, if this sounds super awkward, I'm just, this is kind of a different video for me to make. It's not scripted at all, at all, other than these questions. It's just kind of a different video, so sorry if it doesn't have quite the same energy that you're used to seeing. I have no clue if it does. I'll know when I'm hearing it after I'm editing it, the video. How can your fans help you get recognized by major manufacturers like BenQ, Asus, etc.? I really don't know. Um, I emailed all these LG, Asus, BenQ, uh, and a, whole, a bunch of other stuff too, like Corsair. I emailed them with like a little template I have because I'm not going to keep typing the whole thing up and being like, hey, this is a special email to you. No, it's all templated. So I never got a response. So how you can get the word out? I don't know. Maybe share my spam them. Give them a call and be like, hey, yo, Asus, uh, Bijan really wants that uh, Asus Pro Art something something. It's, it's their new 32 inch 1200 local dimming zone, 4K, 120 hertz pro art display. It is freaking insane. I want that. <laughs> if they just give it to me for like a week to, to test out and review, I'll be happy. If, they, if I can keep it, I would. Oh, if not, I'll just buy it. It's probably gonna be like four or five grand. I'll get that sometime next year, if at all. But that man, one man, man, Asus, hit me up, bruh. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how you guys can really do that. If, you, if anybody in the comments can let somebody know, let them know and I'll pin it so we can get the attention because that'd be nice instead of uh, buying things, returning it if I don't like it, which we'll get more into later. This is a two-part question. With all the products you buy, oh, this actually is what I was just talking about. With all the products you buy, do you keep them or return them? Have any of the retailers you've dealt with thus far given you a hard time about the various returns you have done and do you expect them to? So that was question two. Number one, let's we'll start with number one. Do I keep them or return them? If I like it a lot, if it's if I think it's worthy enough of keeping or probably an upgrade, yes. If not, 
I just return it because there's no point. That's what I ended up doing. Like, here's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, you're, you're such a bad customer. You buy things and return things. I did that before YouTube. It's not because of YouTube I'm doing it. This is how I am as a consumer in general. So I might as well just make videos and hope that I get successful with it. So, yeah. This is just like an addition. Um, and part two, have any of the retailers you've dealt with thus far giving you a hard time about various returns you've done? And do you expect them to? I expect them to eventually because this is more frequent, frequent than it used to be without YouTube. But so far, no. And I don't know if it's going to be bad because two situations specifically. Best Buy. 2016 or 17 when I was really going competitive in CSGO. Um, I bought and returned 12 mice within one month. That's a lot of mice to just be trying out and returning. I ended up sticking with the Wired G Pro, I think it was, which looks like a lot like the uh, wireless G302 or 305. What's this thing called, 305? Yeah, 305. And, um, and another one, Micro Center. I love Micro Center. They're, they are nerd heaven. If you guys don't have a Micro Center near you, you have no clue what you're missing. You really don't. Um, it's like fries for Canada, I think it is. I have no clue. So Micro Center, I went and bought and returned one monitor. This is like when I was interested in getting 2K for just like the immersive stuff. 2K 144 hertz with a physical G-Sync module in it. I don't know why I was so fixated on that, but I was. So I bought and returned one monitor every day for an entire week. So a total of seven monitors I bought and returned and they were just all crappy panels. Sorry, but yeah. So I thought they were gonna ban me when I went there with like the fourth or fifth or sixth monitor, let alone the seventh. But no, they're like, okay, have fun. I mean, I buy a lot of stuff from them and Best Buy and keep it. So the, major the money I spent, I keep at least 66% of the net cost versus what I return. So like the total amount, let's say I have 10,000 spending, I might return 3,300, but I might keep 6,600 of that stuff price-wise. So I keep the majority of things I buy. Creepy question since you said ask, how's the view outside your house? Well, take a look. Do you have your own Discord server? No, not yet. I do plan on making one, but I'm waiting till I get big enough to hey, be like, hey, everybody, go to my Discord server so it doesn't look pathetic when you all get in there. Yes, that is the mentality that I have with it. I don't want it to be like a total, like, disaster, like oh, only like 50 people will join. And that's still a lot. But like, you know, I want my Discord to be like popping. I want like thousands of people rolling in as soon as I post that video, you know? What's your favorite monitor? Currently... The Samsung G7. If it wasn't for that backlight bleed and that freaking huge curve, I don't know why Samsung does that with all their monitors, I would hands down keep it. I mean, I'll deal with the, with the uh, curve. Just don't give me that crazy backlight bleed or other way around. Flat and backlight bleed. Because realistically, I think if it was flat, it would have a lot less backlight bleed than it does with the majority of the units they ship. If you could buy any monitor right now without worrying about the price, what would you get? Well, Right now, that's available, the G7. But also, what I mentioned earlier, that Asus Pro, you know what? Let me get the name of that uh, monitor. I'm not, I don't know the exact Pro Art PA32UCG. That monitor is, I think of the specs of that, and I just cream. Ugh. I'm sorry. That's a bad mental image for a lot of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite sport? game and dream car well for sport esports i don't watch regular sports i don't care about them they don't interest me at all to be honest with you um but esports they count as a sport i think because it's a whole mental thing and uh nerve thing so and, and psychologically as well so it's a different it's a different kind of sport you're not moving your entire body but mentally psychologically and kind of your nerves you really need to be in touch with those uh but that's one thing i've went to ESL won New York 2017 for CSGO. Oh man, that was the best thing I've went to in my entire life. The atmosphere was just insane. If you guys have never been to an esports tournament, you need to go. Like, it's craziest when you go to like League of Legends or Dota 2 or CSGO because those have huge scenes. 
Time made on that and now is for Dent's closer. He forced him to seize that with chances against four as they're completely surrounded around the West Enemy Fire. Only for five games. Welcome to the finals, Brown 9 to play off against Spain. Uh, game, Star Citizen. I don't know if you can see that wallpaper right there, um, but that is Star Citizen wallpaper from Wallpaper Engine. The game's been in development for like seven years, still in alpha. Probably may never get finished, I'm well aware, but I spent hundreds of dollars in that game. And I am waiting for the day to, for it to be finished, even if it's 20 years from now, which it probably is likely to be. Dream car? Realistically, the dream car, well, like, well, my ultimate dream car, Koenigsegg 1 to 1 or a Jera RS. Those are the dream car for me. Um, realistically, what I can probably afford, I don't know. Well, I don't even know if I can afford this, but if I want, if I could, Tesla Roadster, Tesla Model S P100D, as well as, or the Tesla Model 3 Performance, which is probably gonna be in my price range and probably my next car when my lease is up for my car. What are some channels that inspired you? Well, a lot of the ones that I mentioned earlier, Linus Tech Tips, MKBHD, Gamers Nexus. I love Gamers Nexus in particular because Steve, albeit his monotone-ish tone, he does have some voice inflection there, but it's not as crazy as, you know, like me or Linus, but I love him. He has no chill. He will talk shit and he will do it in a sly way or just directly. I love it. And you know what? That's what I do. I there was a comment I responded to yesterday. I posted it on my Instagram and Twitter. Guy was being a total idiot, I think. I could be wrong, but I think I was right. So I don't, I don't care how many subscribers I get. If I see what I think is a dumb comment, I'm going to respond to dumb comments and call you an idiot for calling my subscribers idiots. Whole story, if you wanna see it, go to my Instagram or Twitter. What products do you enjoy reviewing the most? Well, monitors, because here's the thing. Mouse, keyboard, and depends on headsets, certain price ranges. There's really so much you can do. You can't really innovate past what we have right now. You know, wireless, sure, low profile, special switches, boo-hoo. Everybody has a different feel for different switches, so you know, it's kind of hard to impress nowadays with all the current switches that are out there. Monitors are in this phase right now where they went from just being, you know, all like TN 240 hertz and IPS 144 hertz to IPS being not only 244 hertz or 240 hertz, but really good ones too, competing with some of the fastest TN panels, though nothing can touch the XL 2546S yet as far as I've seen. But also, that ASUS monitor I mentioned earlier, um, the price point for that kind of spec is insane. $4,000 to $6,000 for 1,200 local dimming zones, a peak brightness of 1,600 nits, 1,000 sustained, um, 240 hertz, 200, no, 120 hertz 4K with no chroma subsampling because it's probably going to end up using uh, HDMI 2.1. Like, it would be stupid if ASUS didn't do that. But all those new technology that we have not seen, and I can't wait for micro LED, forget that, geez. But like what we are getting now is insane. Like Samsung's monitors, insane. The, the, the new G7, the G9, th that is a, a gamer's wet dream right there. And if you like 4K and high refresh rate, that new Asus monitor, which is really aimed towards creatives. I'm, no, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. I don't create movies. That is for like movies, I, I'm assuming. I want it for gaming. I want to play Star Citizen with that HDR or anything with that HDR. Oh, how long does it take to script, record, and edit your videos? Um, scripting takes up to three, four, or five days. Sometimes it depends because when I write a script, I read it. I take a couple hours break from the script um, and do some testing or I take a day from the script and then I read it again and see what I need to change because things change in your mind like, no, that doesn't sound good enough anymore. You know, it sounded good when you wrote it but then you change it and then you go again the next day and the next day and you're like, oh, maybe I can make some tweaks here and there. So I do that a lot. I always, like I'm always reading the script out loud and it takes up a lot of my day. Like this doesn't sound good. Okay, let's change it with this. Cause a lot of you guys may not know this and I didn't either because it, people like Linus and stuff make it look very easy. Um, writing something that sounds good is not easy unless you know what you're doing. I had no, first of all, I failed English and grammar and spelling and all that, but I know how to spell properly. It was just school. I hate school. So writing a script that sounds good to you guys can be challenging. 
Recording is easy. As soon as I got the script, A-roll, which is me, what I'm doing right now, is like one hour at most, one hour and a half, depending on how long the video is, even two hours sometimes. But um, with a teleprompter, which you guys can't see, it makes it so much easier. Before I got this teleprompter, which thankfully I got early on because it saves so much time. If you guys are ever thinking of doing YouTube, get a teleprompter. I have the Parrot teleprompter. It's a small one where you put your phone in there. I'll leave a link in the description if I remember to do it. If you guys are looking for one, it saves so much time instead of having to try to remember what you're trying to talk about. Um, video editing, easy. B-roll, I have th that wasn't there, but this falls in with editing. B-roll is like one or two straight up full days of recording, making sure what you're getting is good enough, putting lighting in certain areas. I have a small room, so where you are is in the back of the room, and the lens is at like, I'm gonna guess, 50 millimeters um, focal length. Is that what the word is? Focal length? I think so, yep, yeah. anyways. I'm not good with cameras yet, I'm still learning. Um, but yeah, that's how, f you know, from there to here, it's like 10-ish, 12 feet and 18 feet wide, something like that. So it's not a big room, so I constantly need to move things around. B-roll takes up a lot of time. And then editing takes like one day. So I spent almost all the time that I'm at home working on videos. It's barely any more free time for me now. It's, it's a lot for YouTube. What's your favorite piece of tech in your setup? Um, if I had to take a guess, I mean, well, not guess, but like if I could say the entire computer, the entire computer, but one piece in particular because I have a SATA based SSD and an 8700K at 4.8 gigahertz, which just isn't cutting it for video editing. So I hate those. That's why I'm going to upgrade later this year when Ryzen 4 or 5, I think 5000 series are going to call it, comes out. The RTX 2080 because, I mean, graphic, not graphics, high frame rate. That makes me enjoy competitive gaming. Um, oh, no, you know what? No, I will show you a video on it. My jib and head, which you are currently on right now, is my absolute favorite piece of tech. This is what helps with my B-roll get these awesome shots. It's not perfect. Um, I'm sure I set it up correctly. I haven't talked to Edelcron's support, but sometimes there are these jumping issues where the jib moves like this because it's automated and sometimes it's just jittery or sometimes instead of going sl slowly to the end, it kind of just stops even though it's set on the app to do a smooth transition to the end. But that thing, awesome stuff right there for video uh, B-roll. What makes you the most exciting being as, wait, 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 sorry. What makes you the most exciting being as competitive as you are when it comes to the market and new products? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the monitors, being that the monitors are like, as far as I can see, like the ones that are getting the most innovations right now and the most changes and the most new technology, that's what really makes me, oh, right now. Like that's one thing. Okay, so that's more of the personal stuff. This is gonna be more of like questions you have with like tech and, and monitors and, and all this stuff. So if you wanna stay around for this part, cool. If not, if you just wanted to know about my personal life a little bit, that's totally fine. All right, number one. Which one of the monitors ha which one of the monitors you have reviewed you recommend the most and why? So this one was actually about a 240 hertz monitor. I remember him asking that. The major the monitor I recommend the most for both content consumption and gaming is either the Al Alienware AW2521HF or the L model for the lunar light version, or the ASUS, this one even more for gaming, ASUS VG259QM, because the ASUS has ELMB. It has a better black equalizer than the Alienware, and it has a better color vibrance. So if you're more focused towards gaming and you want also something that has very good content consumption uh, capabilities, that Asus is insane. The ELMB, it drops the peak brightness from 415 nits to 207 nits. I remember that at the top of my head, I think. 200-ish nits. It's still plenty bright, not bright enough for, mo for some games, but to get that motion blur down to as low as it is, it's insane. $330-ish for both of those monitors, great value for what you're getting. Can you make a video on how to calibrate monitors? I've been getting a lot of questions on this one, and yes, I will, I think. I don't know when, that's low priority right now, because Hardware Unbox just made one. So if you guys wanna watch one, and I've never watched it yet, so I have no clue how that looks, but if you wanna watch a calibration te um, video, watch his, see if you like it. Um, but I do plan on making one eventually, one for, because the thing is you guys, 
not all of you want to spend 150 ish plus dollars on a good tool like this uh, X right i1 display pro that I use to calibrate my monitors. This is a $230 tool. So not only that, but I also have portrait Calman software, which was an additional $200. I'll be getting the ultimate version in the future when I can, which is $700 with the license and all, but it's expensive stuff. Um, and honestly, I don't like the software that the x right came with. It was absolutely horrible. If you guys are looking for a good free software for your colorimeter, Display Cal, awesome. It's a very, very technical one. So you kind of need to research that because it's very hard to understand what the hell is going on with that software until you research it, or you can just guess. But yeah, I will eventually probably make one. But that's low priority, don't know when I'm gonna make it. Will you review professional creator monitors? So that Asus I mentioned earlier, yes. Um, there are also other cheaper ones um, around the $1,000 or $2,000 price range that I do wanna get my hands on if possible. Those items are a little bit harder to keep and you know, to, to purchase and return. So I do wanna get those. I will probably make creator monitors, which means I'll have to really reevaluate how I do reviews for those because those are more focused towards creators, not towards gaming. So yes, I will include gaming stuff like I normally do, um, but I really gotta figure out how I'm going to review those because that needs a different approach. This one was a specific person. I am a visual art, this can apply to some of you guys. I am a visual arts student. What monitor should I get for casual gaming and content creation with a max budget of 500? LG uh, 27GN850B-B, you don't need the dash B, it's the same thing. That monitor is great, $450. A lot of people have been recommending the Dell S2721DGF as well. I bought the 2719 DGF by accident, which is a TN version and I think last year's model. So I'm returning that because my dumbass bought it. It's right over there. So yeah, I'm going to uh, somehow, I don't know when, within a few months, probably within a month or two, get that monitor and review that as well. What monitor should I get for the upcoming PS5 and Xbox Series X? I think those two monitors I just mentioned in the last question, the Dell, well, again, I don't know what the Dell performs like. I haven't seen it, but apparently it's the same monitor as the LG just by Dell. Same panel, apparently. I have no clue. But the Dell S2721DGF, as far as I know, and the LG 27GN850 are good because they'll let you high refresh rate, and you can also play up to 144 hertz unless you get a Samsung G7, which will do 240 hertz. But I don't know what the limit of PlayStation and Xbox One, uh, Series X is going to be. Is it going to be 4K 120? Like they say that, but is that going to be for like the majority of games? Is that going to be for like indie games? Because I highly doubt if if we can't I have an RTX 2080, but even with an RTX 2080 Ti, it's hard getting even up to 100 FPS with um, 4K. So how are the consoles going to do it? That's my I don't know. We don't know. We'll see later this year, but I'd say a, a really good 1440p 144 hertz panel will be a sweet spot. Do you recommend 240 hertz IPS or TN panels for esports gaming? Is there a big difference between the two panels? So this one is a really good question because there's a lot of people and reviews I see that says goodbye TN, you know, TN sucks now because IPS is there. First of all, no, TN is still the fastest and not for the average monitor, but I'm talking about one monitor in particular. Again, the BenQ Zowie XL2546S. If you have not watched that review, watch it to know what I'm talking about. The response time of 0.5 milliseconds, I don't doubt it. I don't have any tools to test its actual response time, but man, those results were nasty. Um, but with that said, if you go something like with the Asus VG259QM, for example, um, that will have almost similar performance, albeit Diac Plus on BenQ does not lower the screen brightness, whereas ELMB on the Asus does. So we're looking at 200 nits on the Asus with its lowest response time versus 320-ish nits on the BenQ. So that extra brightness can be valuable, though that's a TN panel and the Asus is IPS. So, but even with that, even though the BenQ is still better, though slightly, I would say the majority of people should go with the Asus because not only are you getting the content consumption, but you might most likely won't be able to tell the difference from, that ben, from the BenQ and the Asus, if I put a picture side by side, or not a picture, if I gave you two monitors, forget the whole panel technology differences of one color being bad and one not. If you saw those side by side for ghosting, it would be really hard for you to tell in real time, if at all, that one monitor is better than the other. So yes, technically the TN for the BenQ is better, but it's very 
minuscule. So there you go. I mean, it really depends. If, if you're gonna choose between IPS and TN, it's not that noticeable anymore. It's still like noticeable when you're doing reviews, like when I do reviews, but otherwise, not really for the average person. Do I expect 360 hertz to be a game changer? Not for the average person, again. This is gonna be for top skill level people because these are the people, also here's the thing. Going from 60 hertz to 144 hertz, big difference. Going from 144 to 240, still quite a big difference. A lot of people don't agree with me on that, but that's, I mean, I can see the difference. It's a huge difference I see. Because every time I go back down to 144 hertz, I cringe, it's so slow to me now, I can't deal with it. I'll be, I'm in a 60 hertz Mac, but I know, I know what to expect here. Um, but going from 240 to 360, that's a different story. This is getting to the point where, you know, dimish, diminishing returns. So the first one that as far as I know is by Acer. It's coming out later this year or early next year. It's $1,300 for 360 hertz. And I don't know if it's IPS or TN. But regardless, that's expensive just for 360 hertz. This is not going to be in the reach of the majority of people for now. This is for tournaments, esports players, things like that. Uh, people that need this extra refresh rate. Because even if you might not be able to tell the immediate difference uh, from 240 to 360, the huge difference, even if it's subconscious, is going to be in flicks. Um, there was a study done already, I think it was by NVIDIA, I can't remember, where pro players are 4% more accurate when it comes to flicking, and that's the majority of where you're going to see it because it's going to be smoother and your eyes are processing more with those flicks because there's more information to give your eyes. So um, that, for the, for the pro players, that makes sense because that is a make or break. That is thousands or ha hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that could be lost if they don't have this kind of stuff. So, But for the average person, we are far from it yet. For me, I'll probably get one just because I will never say no to more frames. When, were, when will you review the Gigabyte Aorus KD25F? I'm waiting to find one. As well as the MSI MAG 251RX, I'm still waiting to get one as well. I don't know when I'm gonna get one. I'm trying my best. But pandemic here, screwing up everything everywhere. Can you make a video on your preferred gear like value, mid-range, high-end, and so on, about mice, keyboard, headsets, etc.? Yes. So, as I review more, towards the end of the year, I'm going to make a video about certain price ranges, what you should, what, what's the best for this certain price range, only on things I, rev excuse me, only on things I reviewed, not things that are out there that I didn't review because I won't know how to tell you about it because I've never experienced it personally. So, and I'll make that clear in that video, but I will eventually do something like that once I've had more experience with more products. Excuse me. Okay. Will you ever use Aperture Grill instead of the UFO test? I remember you commenting this in one or two of my videos before and also on this question and answer thing. And I checked it out. I didn't like it. I'm sorry. Um, there was just limited functionality as far as I remember. I tried looking for certain things that I was like used to on the UFO test. I'm like, what? It doesn't have this? Seriously? So I don't know what connection you have with the person making that software, but there's a couple of things that I would like to see added to it and I'll be able to input that information if you like. And this is the last question. And this is a long one. I saved this for last because it's long and it might put somebody to sleep. I know you believe a higher pixels per second or PPS is easier to see trails behind UFOs, but I want to see UFO tests at 960 hertz or PPS. And PPS is pixels per second. I, I probably already said that. All other resources use 960 PPS and it's impossible to cross-reference your information with theirs. Even in your latest video, you use 2400 PPS instead of 1920 PPS like you always do. This is about the LG video, but I'll get into that. So it's even impossible to compare your newest test with your other tests. Um, in addition to this, 960 PPS is, more realistic, is a more realistic scenario for gaming, I think. We don't move cursor that, we don't move cursor that fast in games. So I'm gonna start with that last part because I have to disagree with that. Think of it like this. So open up UFO test right now if you want to, or just memorize whatever you remember. The UFO is moving like this, right? So you're telling me that you don't move faster left and right when you're playing competitive games? So flicking is around 10,000 PPS. Obviously, I can't track that. That's impossible for a human to track uh, with a very short window with your monitor and your camera. Um, so that 960 is just too slow. And eventually, the, the thing is, the trails will blend in with the ghost to the point where you can't really tell how good it can actually perform in higher... Uh, you know, faster turning situations. Uh, in terms of 
960 PPS, I'm not going to do that because like I just said, it's just too slow, I think. But the whole thing about going from two, two, from 1920 pixels per second to 2400 pixels per second, the reason why I'm doing that is because 1080p, 1920 pixels per second. 1080p resolution is 1920 by 1080. So as far as I know, somebody can tell me if this is true or not. I want some actual evidence, not just it's wrong. Say you have a 27 inch 1080p monitor, right? Like this AW2720 right there. If I'm moving a alien at 1920 pixels per second, it'll go from, it'll go from one side to the other at a certain time. And if I get a 27 inch monitor like the LG I reviewed, which was at 2400 pixels per second, the resolution is what? 2560 by 1440. I was looking for a 2560 option for PPS, but it doesn't exist. Um, it, it should, as far as I know, take, because I, I kind of tracked them together, it takes the same amount of time for that alien to go from one side to the other to the other for a 1440p monitor at 2400 pixels per second versus a 1080p monitor at 1920 pixels per second. I know I lost a lot of you on this one. You guys are like, what the f are you talking about? Um, and then 4K, or for example, 27 inch 4K monitor, I would probably do 13, 3840 pixels per second because the pixel density is much more dense. It would take the same amount of time for that 27 inch 4K monitor to go from one side to the other as it would for a 4, uh, 2K monitor at 2400 pixels per second and a 1K or 1080p monitor at 18 or 1920 pixels per second. So that's the reason why I do it that way to make it even because no matter how many pixels you add, no matter how many pixels you add, when you move, you're still looking at the same amount of field of view. So that's why I do it that way. Now, if that's how I understand it. If I'm wrong, let me know. And I will, um, I won't be able to fix the LG because I already returned it. Mine had defects. I would have loved that monitor for content creation. Um, but yeah, let me know. So that was the last question. Again, thank you all very much for, uh, for this. Um, there's a lot of opportunities I see coming up in the future. Please tell me the camera is not focused, is focused because it doesn't look totally focused on my monitor. I hope this is focused. If not, you're gonna be seeing a blurry video of me. This is my third time recording this. Twice, two days ago when I did the A-roll for the keyboards, for the keyboard you can't see right behind me, and one now. So, it's getting, can't be wasting my time recording it all the time. So, other than that, I mean, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Again, I really appreciate it. I'm not going to stop, ever. As long as I see this being an opportunity where I can quit my job and enjoy doing something I love. Like, yes, I like my job. There's nothing wrong with my job. However, the auto industry is a very slow moving industry. It's so boring when you talk about the same damn thing all day, every day for years before they decide to switch something. And that could be one thing if the car is just refreshed and not completely redesigned. It's so boring. I love being able to talk about new things and be blown away by things that I've not seen before and are constantly changing months after months. It's insane. It's so much fun because it's like, oh, finally, something new to talk about. So, yeah, thank you for making this, the future of YouTube for me, visible. Here's the thing. Some people will not like that I'm going to be saying it that way, but there's nothing wrong with me wanting to make YouTube a career. I just want to let that know. There's nothing wrong. That means I'll be able to make more videos and have more detail in them and more consistent videos. So um, I'm waiting for that day if that ever happens. Um, but yeah, I have nothing else to say. I don't know what else to say really, um, except this is also really mind blowing, honestly. 10,000. It's like, who the? 10,000 of you guys want to watch me? What the fuck? So um, yeah, thank you very much. And as always, have a great day every day. Peace.